not their monographies. So we have a relative freedom to prepare different types of remedies, including several scales, patterns, and methods of potentization in pharmacies following our pharmacopoeia. My main personal and professional concern at this moment for, for the last years is about the expiry date of dynamized solution. I'm not talking about mother tincture. I'm not talking about loud potents or the final remedy that goes to the patient's house but the potents that are kept inside the laboratories, in the pharmacies, or even in, in the industries. They are kept under controlled conditions in a strong vehicle, alcohol, alcoholic vehicle, and a fixed five years time of life has no scientific uh, reason to be, and make us lose good remedies that may not be able, we are not, may, may not be able to have them again. About the challenge, since 2013, pharmacists are allowed to prescribe OTC medicines. And this includes almost the totality of the homeopathic remedies in Brazil. Considering that we have achieved a good standardization level for the remedies, the challenge now is to prepare pharmacists to help people, how to help people with homeopathic remedies especially those for acute symptoms with responsibility, ethics, and knowledge. This is our future, what you have to do now and for the future. future. Thank you very much. I'm here for any further questions. Thank you. We see uh, just uh, as an intermediate remarks that uh, our organizers really did a great job in preparing the people, but also giving us the opportunity to run around the globe in uh, less than one hour. And so I think uh, it's really very worthwhile to get a glance and insight in all these different systems. We now come back to Asia, crossing the Pacific, and um, now it's starting uh, to be more challenging for me to find the right pronunciation of the names uh, of our presenters. Uh, but uh, I apologize if I'm not perfect in it, as you may tell me after the session. Next uh, is Mrs. Tanu Radha Mayawen from Malaysia. She is Principal Assistant Director at the National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency and will give us the regulator's perspective on homeopathy in Malaysia. Please welcome. Okay. Good morning, good ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, organizer, for giving me a wonderful opportunity to share on how uh, Malaysia regulates homeopathy products. As for Malaysia, homeopathy product falls under natural product category, which means the product will be assessed for its quality and safety. And um, things like uh, formulation, dose, and indication are example of information that uh, will be thoroughly assessed during pre-registration. And it is a um, uh, marketing authorization holder have to uh, submit a reliable reference uh, to support their proposed uh, formulation, dose, and indication. And of course, any uncertainty of, on the product information will be clarified uh, with the applicant through our online system. And apart from a relation of the product dossier, we also verify the GMP status of the foreign manufacturer. And um, for foreign manufacturer, the, they, they, they need to uh, submit their standard that have been used by the authority to inspect their plant. And this is to ensure that the standard used by the uh, foreign manufacturer is equivalent to standard used by uh, Malaysian authority. As for safety reason, each product will be tested before registration and uh, um, limit of heavy metal and microbial contamination tests are some of the tests that we will conduct uh, during pre-registration. And um, NPRA also continue to regulate the registered homeopathy products through surveillance activity and uh, registered products will be sampled and tested for compliance to what has been approved or current uh, requirements. NPRA will take necessary actions uh, in form of uh, recourse or warning if we found any, um, uh, if the product is not conformed with what had been approved. Um, the regulation, next slide please. Next slides please. May we have the next okay. slide? Okay. Uh, the regulation of uh, natural product, in, uh, including homeopathy product in Malaysia remains a challenge. 
issues such as incomplete documentation and uh, also falsification of the data submitted to NPRI uh, often arise during pre-registration. Moreover, the uh, level of awareness on the NPRI current requirements and guidelines among um, some product registration holders still low. So in order to um, overcome these issues, we have come up with a guideline, a uh, drug registration guidance document, and to, uh, to assist uh, our applicants that it serves as a, as a reference guide for the registration process, including quality control, inspection, and licensing, and product post-registration activities of medicinal product. This light guideline will be uh, reviewed every six months, and it can be downloaded from our official website. Mm, NPRA also works close and collaborate with the local industry and industry association to further enhance the effectiveness of the current practice in the regulatory system. And also another method is dialogue sessions are used as a platform to ensure the industry is constantly updated with the current regulatory affair. And that's the overall summary of how uh, NPRA regulate homeopathy product in Malaysia. And thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much. And our next station will be Japan, where we get uh, a manufacturer's and distributor's perspective. And the presentation was made available by Dr. Toraku Yui. So please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am very honored to be, be uh, invited to this present uh, here with the top leader of homeopathy in the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Machanda. I think the slide is wrong. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't have a slide. Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, please let me tell about the current homeopathic situation in Japan briefly. Um, I was graduate as a homeopathy in the UK, and I brought homeopathy to Japan. I educated homeopathy, set up homeopathy clinic and manufacture to make remedy and mother tincture. I am also practicing natural farming now. Also, homeopathy didn't exist in Japan about 20 years ago, but it has grown largely now. The number of professional homeopaths is about 600. The number of homeopathy clinic, about 300. The number of homeopathy user, about 2 million people. Homeopathic products are under control Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare, Government of Japan. Homeopathy Japan Corporation Limited is the sole homeopathic product manufacturer in Japan. Please watch about homeopathy Japan's activity in video, please. We, Homeopathy Japan, manufacture homeopathic products under our motto, Gentle to the Environment, Mind and Body, in order to stick obstinately to wishes and teachings from Dr. Tarako Yui, the founder and the person who introduced and spread homeopathy in Japan, reform Japanese common sense of food and nutrition, and secure the quality of safe and sound ingredients. We have chosen our way to begin with natural farming. We began full-scale natural farming in 2006. We found an uncultivated land that had never been contaminated by any chemical fertilizers in Toya, Hokkaido. The climate in Toya, Hokkaido is similar to the one in Europe, so it is suitable for growing herbs. We are cultivating about 60 kinds of herbs without using any pesticides. This agricultural sector of Homeopathy Japan became an independent agricultural corporation, Nippon Toyuke Natural Farming, in October 2011. Homeopathy Japan in Atami, near to Mount Fuji, stocks about 300 kinds of remedies and produces 600,000 bottles annually. We make 
remedies at our in-house shrine using a wake-up process. From the shrine, we can see trees in the mountain. We enter a tranquil state of mind before using this wake-up process of remedies. Patterns of original substances are activated by repeating dilution and succussion over and over, becoming strong remedies. Homeopathy Japan does a succussion 41 times. 41 is said to have the maximum spiritual power, therefore they become very high-spirited remedies. The completed remedies are packed carefully by hand under high sanitary standards. Products from Homeopathy Japan are categorized into three main types. First, homeopathic remedies. The range is wide, from single remedies to combination remedies and home kits to meet the needs of our customers. Secondly, mother tinctures that are spirits of herbs of Mother Earth. Organic herbal tinctures Roman Toya supports you internally and externally. Thirdly, Far East Flower Essence purify and beautify people's minds, increasing their spirituality. We, Homeopathy Japan, appreciate love from nature and wish many people to spend a happy, healthy life by pursuing a way of life following the laws of nature currently possessed by humans. Thank you very much. Um, moreover, um, we had a, a home kit. A 1,500 uh, uh, people, mother, using this acute disease. So we are home, uh, professional homeopaths for 600 there, but uh, also mother needs such kind of remedy, them to use. To. So please let them to use to more remedy. That is a more expand of Japan, uh, Japanese homeopathy in, in the, at, at the moment. So uh, not professional people only use homeopathy. Please let's give them to use to the remedy for commoner people, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yui. Our next uh, destination now is China. We will have uh, first a distributor's perspective, which will be given by Dr. Tokalun Aron. He is president of the Hong Kong Association of Homeopathy and also the president of the Macau Association of Homeopathy. Please, Dr. Aron, you have the floor. Good morning, I'm Aaron's translator and I'm going to speak for him. And uh, yes, our topic is uh, uh, from a distributor's point of view uh, to view uh, how's the situation now in China. So in China, there are basically four different systems, which include China, mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Uh, homeopathy practice is not regulated in mainland China, but in Hong Kong, the government advised association kind of based voluntary registration. And in Macau, there is in fact ongoing discussion on how to regulate homeopathic, homeopathy practice in the Legislative Council this year. And in Taiwan, it is not regulated. For homeopathy in medicinal products, it is not regulated as long as uh, it is not in included in the TCM, I mean the traditional Chinese medicine list and allopathic drug list. And uh, they should not have any medical claims. And the problems we are facing now in China is first, uh, the sales of remedy which are listed in the TCM or drug ordinance uh, will carry legal risks. And second, um, there is actually full of fake homeopathic medicinal products in the market. Uh, they are basically uh, over-the-counter TCM kind of uh, products, and, uh, but they are named themselves as homeopathy medicinal products. Uh, we, we can give some example. Some of them are actually tea leaves, just traditional Chinese kind of tea leaves, but then uh, it is named as homeopathy products. And some more ridiculous kind of products is a homeopathy hairbrush, which is um, more beneficial uh, to alopecia and uh, even tumors on the scalp. So uh, the situation now, in main, especially in mainland China and Taiwan, uh, is 
like this. And um, third, uh, because uh, there is a lack of recognized status in the in this in the government, so uh, we cannot get any resource from the government. And so the quality of the um, homeopathy medicinal product has to be safeguarded by really responsible distributors. However, in reality, uh, there are many nonsense use of uh, potencies. Sometimes they use really dangerously. They have dangerous use which are potencies which are really high or really low uh, by untrained persons who are not registered under the professional associations. And uh, in fact, we can also attempt to register remedy along the track of allopathic medicine, uh, but the cost will be really high because it is charged in mainland China per medical claim. So, uh, in future, uh, we think um, actually homeopathic practice, uh, home homeopath regulation should be done before the HMP regulation because we want to make sure that the policy that will be set are tailor made for the need and um, for the of homeopathy. And because we think individualized treatment is essential for good quality homeopathy practice, so uh, we think HMP distribution should be tied up with trained professionals so that the growth can be um, more sustainable. And uh, in all the four systems, uh, traditional Chinese medicine policies are actually separated and distinct from the allopathic policies. So similarly, we think the HMP regulation should be distinct from both of the existing um, medicinal or product uh, policies. Um, definition of HMP has to be really clear to protect homeopathy from the trend of fraudulent confusion between TCM and a homeopathic product in mainland China. First, at the raw material level, and second, at the production and um, manufacturing production level, and third, they have to be free from any other additives, including TCM. And we think single remedies and complex remedies should be regulated differently. And so this is a really quick review on the condition now we are having in our region. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen, and of course also to your translator for pre giving us the presentation. We will have another presentation from China by Professor Jiangping Liu. He is professor at the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. And he will have 15 minutes for his talk um, according to the program. So, Professor Liu, you're invited to give us your presentation. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thanks to the organizer for inviting me to be here. And I would like to present uh, about the situation in China, in mainland China. At the moment, we have uh, three uh, mainstream medical health care system, Western medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and integrated medicine. So the proportion of uh, traditional Chinese medicine and integrated medicine is about 40%. So in China, TCM is a mainstream medicine. It's not a complementary medicine. And from the data uh, delivered by the government white paper, traditional Chinese medicine in China, we can see the health delivery, nearly 4,000 hospital, and the integrated medicine hospital is 400, uh, about 50. And government back to the TCM clinics is about uh, 42,000. And the integrated medicine in, uh, clinics is about 7,000. 7, so the total uh, patient visit in the government hospital and clinic is uh, 910 million per year. Uh, and the TCM practitioner registered is uh, 452,000. So we also have the education of 42 uh, colleges uh, on TCM. So, during the last uh, 20 years, a movement toward the evidence-based medicine in China. So government funds uh, research, cl clinical research, uh, to set up the evidence for traditional medicine. And during the recent past five years, we also developed the clinical practice guideline 
And now I think it's over 300 uh, clinical guidelines on TCM and integrated medicine. And also establishing the evidence-based essential drug list for the government and also for the insurance policy. So given an example of the ancient history and until the current knowledge, we know that from the ancient classical books, Qing Hao Su is used to treat fever in patients. So during the 1970s, the government invest money to do the research on identify the active ingredients from the traditional herbs. So Qing Hao Su atomicillin was identified and finally it got the Nobel Prize 2015. About homeopathy, no official healthcare service in mainland China and no policy regulations and academic institution. But interestingly, for the China Association of Traditional Chinese Medicine, they used to be, have a homeopathy specialty committee. And after running for about 10 years, it's closed because it's not active in the uh, society. But that's back to 20 years ago. So currently, the homeopathy products is a sailing on the internet. It's an online sailing, like uh, Professor Tu just mentioned. Some of the main challenges in the development, I think it's difficult to stand alone as a healthcare system in China if developed in the future, but it's possible to be part of the integrated medicine care. So I think education is, uh, is most important. And of, of course, the knowledge dissemination among the public and medical fields. And also we need some research evidence to relieve the debate around the homeopathy science. So for example, in China, a discussion about a miracle from homeopathy, and also some people thought it's a pseudoscience. And there are some surveys from the public. So the advocate from the homeopathy said it's increased the human being's self-healing capacity. And the opponent said homeopathy is a pseudoscience as a pseudotherapy and taking the beneficial effect from the placebo effect similar to that. And some experts said there's no effect in the pharmacological aspect, but it's effect in the biological aspect so that people need to understand what is the mechanism of the homeopathy therapy in uh, medicine. So how to get it accepted from my point of view in mainland China, I think research first and then education, regulation, profession, and finally integration. So for example, we need some evidence, research evidence, here is one effectiveness and safety of homeopathic medicinal products in a pediatric upper respiratory tract infection. So I think a randomized trial, this is done by Professor Hesselin. And also later on you can find quite a lot similar research, multi-center, uh, open, uh, comparative, randomized control trials showing that the effectiveness of the homeopathy products in prevention of recurrent acute upper respiratory tract infection, especially in children. So we have a lot of good example in clinical practice, but we also still need some evidence from the research. So finally, uh, I would like to uh, reflect about uh, whether homeopathy can be integrated in mainland China in the healthcare system. So we can get some reflection from the integral medicine development in China. Actually, the history of integral medicine in China is quite old. In uh, 1944, Chairman Mao Zedong uh, addressed the collaboration between the Western medicine and traditional Chinese medicine to create a new medicine. And in 1956, four public TCM colleges, uh, universities set up in Beijing and Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Chengdu. And then there's an association developed and university uh, specialties for integrated medicine and traditional medicine. Also the association uh, uh, for the different specialty. I think the good uh, information is that there is a knowledge in exchange 
in the Western medicine education and also traditional medicine education for both knowledge. And the way of integration is at the diagnostic level and treatment level. And the model of integration is also in considering about different tertiary and secondary primary care. So some of the achievements here and the future direction is evidence-based, more research and regulation, et cetera. So finally, I would summarize that no culture rooted in tradition, both patients and physicians know little about it, and lack of infrastructure and no regulation yet. But we have opportunity uh, to more uh, uh, to help to healthcare needs and to introduce as part of the integral medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu, for your presentation and um, also for the reflections you gave us uh, about this interplay of these different um, disciplines which are then um, used in China. The next presentation is from South Africa, so we are going to a different continent. But uh, unfortunately, Dr. Gower, the council member of the Medicines Control Council of South Africa and lecturer at the University of Johannesburg, couldn't make his way here to um, New Delhi. So we have just a presentation, and we will use just a, a few minutes um, to have a look on it. Uh, I invite you just uh, to look. So the first slide is uh, just introducing the regulation of homeopathic medicinal products in South Africa. Next slide, please. My name is Dr. Neil Gower. I'm a member of the Medicines Control Council. Ah, I'm also the chairperson okay. of the Complementary Medicines Committee, which provides recommendations to the council. And the way it operates in South Africa is generally council members are employed primarily in other fields. And so I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Homeopathy at the University of Johannesburg. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity today of being able to present to you the regulation of homeopathic medicinal products in South Africa, and I'm sure your event will be extremely successful. How we regulate medicines in South Africa is across a broad, broad range of different types of medicines separated into categories. For the purpose of this slide, we will talk about category A medicines or our orthodox medicines, otherwise referred to as medicines for human use as currently defined or Category D medicines, which is being created for complementary medicines or human or animal use. These are further subdivided into discipline-specific medicines and health supplements. Discipline-specific medicines are bumped to being at Category A medicines when they contain isolates other than provided for by the specific discipline or the traditional use. Health supplements are regarded as being Category A medicines when they contain scheduled substances or substances above a particular dosage level or they claim to treat any disease. This slide shows how it is that the two subcategories of complementary medicine are further divided into the discipline specific medicines on the left from aromatherapy through to western herbal medicines and that's where you find homeopathy and health supplements from probiotics through to enzymes. I won't go through all of them. An additional discipline so to speak is combination products which is contained within a discipline specific framework which allows for a number of different disciplines to be put together and suitably motivated for such purpose but also for disciplines to be included with other types of health supplements as well where the review or registration process will default to a higher risk profile potentially if indicated for disease under a discipline specific indication. Here is a list of the guidelines which we have published on our website which appears at the bottom of the page. These guidelines deal with particularly the safety and efficacy of discipline specific medicines which you see on the first row and health supplements on the fourth row and a guideline that pertains to quality of all types of complementary medicines which we see at the bottom. The two bolded guidelines specifically deal with requirements for homeopathic medicines on a quality, safety and efficacy perspective. Complementary medicines may make a claim to treat diseases so long as that they are able to provide us with the clinical data that would permit its registration in such instances. This table is taken from the original WHO recommendation of how to deal with traditional medicines on the basis of risk. And so they would need to be able to provide for their traditional use from any of the references provided 
and also give us clinical data. Low risk levels, which includes health maintenance or general health enhancements or relief of minor symptoms, may require only traditional evidence. In the case of homeopathy, this would be reference to particular pharmacopoeias, monographs, materia medicas, or even repertories, and other references that are contained within homeopathic literature to show that it has been used previously in the tradition. In order for a product that was on the market prior to 15th November 2013 to remain on the market, it is a requirement of our regulations that they include, include particular wording on their labelling saying that this medicine has not been evaluated by the Medicines Control Council. This medicine is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure,